Uh, let's turn then to uh, the uh, final scheduled uh, speaker for the day, and we're going to hear about side mount uh, uh, options uh, from John Shannon. Okay. You guys didn't tell me there was blood in the water um, before I <laughs> volunteered to do this. And, and I, you know, just as a senior NASA manager, let me let me say I, I don't agree with that. And and um, I felt perfectly comfortable coming up here and talking about an alternate architecture, something that we've looked at for many years. Uh, and I, you know, Jeff and Steve Cook and company have have embraced and we've talked about it. We talk about transition between programs all the time. Um, so if you're worried about going to talk to anybody, come talk to me. Um, talk to, to Wayne Hale, talk to Mike Suffredini, talk to Brent. I, I, just come talk to us and we'll, you know, if you don't want us to attribute things to you, we can, uh, we can certainly do that, but we're always looking for good ideas. And I, I think just the fact that I'm standing up here uh, talking about something that departs from, uh, from the current baseline should, should maybe prove that to you. Um, stay on the title page for a minute. Uh, I want to preface the presentation uh, with some other comments here that NASA has a plan. NASA has a baseline plan. And I think it was a well thought out plan uh, in the time of ESAS. And, uh, and that the, the Constellation program has put together a viable architecture. And, uh, and I'm not going to talk about an architecture, I'm just going to talk about a launch vehicle. Um, but it has not been funded. Uh, it has not been funded to the level uh, that we would, uh, we would need to, to see it through. And I see that on the shuttle side from the transition. Jeff Hanley and myself uh, worked with our teams. We had a very close-knit transition plan, not just for civil servants, but also for contractors. Um, and because of the funding problems, that, that has become unknit. And, uh, and we have gaps in the, uh, in the industrial capability and, and in the workforce, which is causing all this. I don't think it is some big conspiracy. I don't think they've had cost overruns. I think they've just not been funded the way that they were, uh, the plan was originally uh, produced. Um, you know, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. And I think that the first option should be to fund the plan that we have. But if we can't do that, I, I don't think we're ready to seed human spaceflight, like, uh, like Elon said. We're not ready to seed support of the ISS. We're not ready to seed the opportunity to go outside of low Earth orbit. Um, so I've had a small team inside the shuttle program that has kept alive some of the side mount discussions. And when I say small, it is three people that uh, go and grab some information from other people to, to think about new things. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But you need to realize it has been a small effort. It has not been across NASA. It has not had the, the uh, advantage of, of being looked at across the agency for good reason. It's because we have another plan and it's just now that we're looking at it and seeing the budget does not, uh, does not quite align with it. So what I'm gonna tell you today is promising it has some benefits, some things that could, um, uh, that are, are uh, obvious advantages, but um, uh, it needs to be looked at to a much greater level than uh, than what my team has been able to do. Now I want to. We're still on the title page, and I've burned like four minutes. Um, this does not look like Shuttle C. I don't even call it Shuttle C. We call it a heavy lift vehicle. Shuttle C was um, a, an autonomous vehicle that separated from the external tank, just like the orbiters had uh, orbital maneuvering capability, uh, attitude capability, thermal capability, a lot of different things that this does not have. This is simply a first and second stage to inject a payload into a 30 nautical mile by 120 nautical mile orbit. Uh, that payload is assumed to be autonomous. It takes care of itself. When it's injected, it goes off and does its thing. And uh, all that you see in the title page picture goes into the ocean. Um, so it's just a, it's a foundational kind of a launch capability. Um, let's go to the next chart. We've looked at, at this a lot. It's been called a lot of different things. Uh, you can see what I was talking about on the, uh, on the upper left. Uh, it was looked at by industry five years ago. It was a two-year study, so there was a, a lot of data out there. I know we've provided a lot of that to you. Uh, it did not have a uh, deployable fairing uh, when you get out of the atmosphere, and, and this team I have uh, added that, uh, which gave you a little bit more performance. It also... Um, the, the beauty of, I think, the, the most recent concept the team has come up with uh, is that it does not try to reuse engines. We have learned from life cycle costs on uh, SSMEs that 
Uh, you never, you, reusability is a myth in my opinion. Uh, you don't buy your engines and then you never have to talk to the engine manufacturer again. You just keep using them. That's, that's not true at all uh, because parts wear out. You have failures. You have design issues. Uh, so you have to keep your production line going or at least available to you, and that's a significant cost. And then you buy one of pieces whenever you, uh, you need new parts, and that gets to be extremely expensive. Um, so we, we would take, the uh, I think, the approach of uh, you get rid of the very... I'll say hazardous, it's probably the most hazardous part, I think, on the orbiter of that interface between the, uh, the main engines and the external tank. And you used to have straight pipes. You don't have all of your disconnects and your pyro systems and, and all of those things. Um, let's go to the next chart. So it's an, that chart was just supposed to say we've looked at this many times over many years, and I think most of the people in this room are familiar with a lot of that. Uh, this is just the basic cargo configuration. Uh, if you notice, it, it doesn't modify the external tank at all. It's exactly uh, the external tank we produce right now. It's the solid rocket boosters we produce right now. Um, the boat tail that holds the SSMEs that are unchanged uh, is simplified because it is bolted directly onto the external tank. It does not have the separation plane, uh, which causes that complexity. Uh, an avionics module in front of it. I'll talk about avionics in a minute and then a separable fairing that, uh, that provides that performance boost up to about 72 metric tons to that uh, 30 by 120 orbit. Next chart. This is, uh, this is an important chart here. Um, what I would, let me back up for a second here. I think Elon Musk hit it exactly right. Um, the way the Russians do things is, is really smart. Uh, I wish we would have done Shuttle C in the 80s or the 90s. I think the Space Shuttle Orbiter would be a safer vehicle to fly if we had done Shuttle C back then. Um, because if you have a cargo vehicle that is the same configuration as your crewed vehicle, uh, you have the opportunity to roll in new design, new enhancements on that cargo vehicle much easier than you do on your manned vehicle. Uh, and that's what the Russians do. For the most part, they'll fly uh, new hardware on their progress uh, several times before they roll it into the Soyuz. And we have a terrible track record in the space shuttle program from upgrades. We did main engine upgrades, controller upgrades, uh, some things like that. It cost us way too much money. It took way too much time. I think that is because you do not have a combined environment's test capability uh, except to go fly the vehicle with a crew on it. Um, so that made it very difficult. Uh, I think if we'd have done Shuttle C, we would have been able to roll in those upgrades on the cargo vehicle and, uh, and verify through combined environment flight testing they actually are effective and then you can roll them into the, into the crewed vehicle. And I, I'm, I'm just guessing, but I think that our upgrades program would have been much more successful uh, from that standpoint. So the thought here was that uh, you build this block one, which is just a two-stage capability to get to low Earth orbit. I said before, no change to the external tank, no change to the SRBs, no change to the SSMEs. You use existing avionics, and I grew up in the guidance, navigation, and control world, and, uh, and that is absolutely possible. The, the one thing that nobody has talked about in all the, the rocket designs that we've seen that is an enormous bullet, and those of you that have, been, that have ever worked with uh, rockets or even our, uh, our uh, modern aircraft is flight software. It, is, it will eat your lunch. It'll, it is critical path from the day you put the first rocket drawing down on paper. Uh, and getting flight software to work with your hardware from a timing standpoint is extremely difficult. Uh, we've been flying the space shuttle for 30 years and we'll still find things through simulation uh, that we did not expect in the way software interacts with hardware. Uh, this block one capability, you can use your existing flight software. You can use the computers that we have right now. You can use the rate gyros, the IMUs. Uh, the accelerometer assemblies, uh, all of those things required to fly any spacecraft, but you've already got 30 years of flight test behind it uh, and use it. Now, I would not use the full suite that we use on an orbiter. You can use one of each and, uh, and be perfectly safe. The flight software can be modified just to know off the, uh, the channels that you're not flying on that particular spacecraft. The other one that nobody's talked about that um, we spend a lot of time and money on is your systems integration tools, uh, the acoustic models, your aerodynamic models, structural models, uh, loads, uh, your, your trajectory models. 
extremely important. Uh, as you all know, and, and Bo actually wrote a paper on it not too long ago, uh, we totally blew the acoustics for STS-1 and, uh, and almost lost the vehicle. We had a, we had a structural member buckle in the ohms pod uh, just because we did not have the water flow and the acoustics right. So if you use a more evolutionary approach that has the same uh, or similar mold line of the, uh, of the space shuttle stack now, you already have that history and you can roll that into your next, uh, into your next vehicle. And that's a, that's a big deal. Those are two things I think flight software and your environmental tools that people really overlook when they're starting to design a vehicle and, and don't understand very well. Um, existing pad structure that, that follows um, the launch and ground control software, that's important because that, again, it's software and, and it'll eat your lunch if you don't, uh, if you don't uh, get it right. That high-risk aft interface, it's just bolted on, so you got rid of that. Um, you don't have fuel cells, you'd have batteries, you don't have the cryo systems because you don't have fuel cells or people on it, nitrogen tanks, the cooling systems, your orbital maneuvering system, your RCs, you don't have any hypergols on it uh, at all. Um, so it's a, it's a very slimmed down and, uh, and streamlined kind of vehicle. And that's all very different from the shuttle C. Block two, uh, of course you can do things to get more performance and at some point we will run out of uh, spares and hardware that is cannibalized from orbital vehicles and, uh, and you would end up building. But the nice thing is you're doing flight test with your, uh, with your basic design uh, as you're uh, beginning to, uh, to procure your, uh, your follow-on avionics. Next chart. I already talked about infrastructure facilities. You all know how we do uh, space shuttles. You can obviously see uh, that, that you don't have to buy a new ET barge. Nobody's talked about that. You, know? you don't have to buy a new Pegasus. You don't have to do a solid rocket booster or anything like that that changes. And my complete unadeptness at PowerPoint means that cargo carrier is really fat there. I just noticed that, but I just stretched the picture out and that's why it looks like that. Next chart. I don't, I, the last one, great graphics, that was good. Um, they've, the team has looked at uh, uh, payload envelopes and designs, and uh, actually I think we found uh, from the industry study that uh, we would have a, a CG problem and, and the center main engine would, would hit its gimbal limits, um, so we actually shrunk the, uh, the payload envelope a little bit. Um, they've done some studies. Again, this is something that needs a great deal of work from the broader community. Uh, from the NASA team, from the aerospace team to, uh, to show. Uh, it does look like, you know, with the 72 metric tons that you could, uh, could do quite a bit with that, uh, that payload capacity. Next chart. <laughs> Everyone had one incomprehensible chart, so this is mine. Uh, and it is just the, uh, it is just the flow of uh, avionics and hardware required between block one and then a follow-on block one that has some new stuff and then a block two where you go to all the new stuff. And, uh, and basically, if you, if you look across the top, there's, there's no really new builds for avionics in the Block 1 uh, architecture. We could build it with the hardware we have in hand right now. Excuse me. Next chart. SSMEs, everybody comes, oh, Shuttle C is great, but you've got to throw your SSMEs away, and that makes it unsustainable, and it's unaffordable, and let's move on to the next, uh, next vehicle. Uh, SSME, we have uh, a million seconds of uh, runtime on. We understand SSME performance very well. Um, I have 14 assets right now, limited by nozzles that uh, you could go fly in a test program. Uh, we have all the hardware we're set up to do the test. There is uh, Pratt Whitney Rocketdyne can provide you books of data on the RS-25E, which is expendable, uh, which is your channel wall nozzle, the non-refurbished turbo pumps. The fact that you're not trying to refly these engines means you don't have inspection ports and you don't have a lot of different requirements that uh, that you would that we have built into the SSME. Um, that has caused the cost to be significant. And it, you can't really take an SSME cost and say, well, that's what the expendable cost would be because what you do for expendables is you put them on a production line and, uh, and you would commoditize it, basically. And that's how you would build a certain number per, uh, per year and then you'd have the economy of scale to, uh, to do that. So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of data on there and, and we'll let PWR go get it if you guys want. Next chart. I really debated cost est putting cost estimates in here. Um, the team needs to validate these. I, I wasn't going to put them in because I said, well, you guys haven't spent enough time on this. Then I looked at the industry study that was done in 0405. The costs were almost exactly the same. I put them in here for your interest. Take your big grain of salt right now. And, uh, and we need to go validate these numbers uh, externally. Next chart. Uh, 
everything I just said about cost, I'll say about schedule. Uh, the industry team and the NASA team somewhat independently came up with, if you turn it on, it's a, it's a four and a half year project to fly your first uh, test flight. Um, we need to, to work on this some more and, and, and debate it and get a better schedule. So take your second big grain of salt now. Next chart. We did some design reference missions just to show is this even something that, uh, that would be useful. It is obviously at, uh, at 70 plus metric tons. Uh, a heavy lifter that is, there is not another vehicle right now other than the space shuttle that, uh, that provides that kind of uh, injection capability. Uh, but would it be useful? And, uh, and this gets a little bit into architecture and I, I don't want to get into architecture, I just want to talk to you about the launch vehicle. But uh, these are some of, the, uh, some of the ideas the team has thrown out and again I would say that this needs a lot of work with the, uh, with the broader community. Next chart. Thought being, this is, you can kind of see the, uh, the approach, normal solid rocket booster separation, fairing separation. Uh, you hit MECO and, and off goes your upper stage with, uh, with uh, autonomous rendezvous and docking capability, which actually, if we would have launched this morning, we were gonna demonstrate the uh, autonomous rendezvous and docking capability. Uh, we put some sensors on the, in the payload bay of, uh, of Endeavor and, uh, and we'll demonstrate that software. And I hope, although doing it within eight flights is gonna be difficult, I hope to have the, uh, the capability to demonstrate the shuttle autonomous docking uh, to, the, uh, to the ISS, at least we'll get the sensor data and then put it on the ground through simulation and be able to show that. And then you toss your, um, your external tank with the big keel structure that goes up to the bipod fitting that holds the, uh, the boat tail into the, uh, into the Pacific Ocean. Next turn. Design reference mission, just what it looks like, and obviously a phase with station. Next chart. Okay, on time. We have looked at, uh, at crewed options. Um, this was the ISS crew piece. Um, we have done some early assessments on the uh, launch abort system, uh, being close to the inner tank, um, and it looks doable. Again, this is a prime area of heavy study to look at the last. You'll see a chart where I show safety. Um, it all depends on how uh, effective we can make a launch abort system uh, work. Thought here would be that you would, uh, you would end up injecting the carrier with an MPLM or external payloads and, uh, and you would fly actually around and, and dock with it and then fly to the station. Next chart. This is the crew and logistics launch just like before. Next chart. There's also a, uh, a profile where you could do a two launch, one from pad A, one from pad B. You may have noticed before Hubble we had a, a shuttle sitting out at each of the two pads. So the, from a ground op standpoint, that was maybe a precursor look at how you could do that. Uh, lunar lander with an Earth departure stage uh, on it, next chart. And, uh, and then fly Orion, uh, same discussion we had on LASS uh, with its Earth departure stage, next chart. And again, we're into architecture. What I would do is, as opposed to training two EDSs with, uh, with a lander and a, and a CEV, I would go and put my, uh, uh, put the uh, lunar lander uh, in lunar orbit, and, uh, and then if it has hypergalls on it, you can go whenever you want. Um, you can launch your, uh, your crewed vehicle. Um, I'll say right out, this is not the lunar lander that is currently in the baseline architecture. Uh, this is a different lunar lander. Um, the guys just were running some calculations. It was a 28 metric ton lander. Um, Doug, what's the Altair right now is 45-ish. Um, Apollo was 16-ish, okay. so it's a it's a different architecture, and, and that's something you have to understand right off. It's not as capable as what the uh, Ares Five uh, architecture looks like. Um, you know, we can talk the same uh, depot discussion. I, I like depots, but but there's again there are different architectures than what we have right now, and this has not received sufficient study time from uh, uh, the broader community to uh, to. Uh, to say this is the answer in any in any way at all. Next chart. Oh, okay. I got two incomprehensible charts. This is a baseball card of just uh, performance between the cargo version uh, for block one and uh, and block two, and then the crude version. Next chart. This is. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We we are flying at the max rate uh, on the uh, shuttle program in fiscal year ten. If we were going to move into something like this, I would lobby strongly to uh, spread out the fiscal year 10 uh, launches into 11 and in 12 
and uh, as we uh, restarted production for solid rocket boosters and external tanks, and, uh, and the configuration is so similar, you, you know, production is really what you have to worry about, and, uh, and you could essentially get rid of most of the gap by doing that. Now, you will have a gap because Orion, uh, the Orion development time is what would pace the, the next crewed vehicle. Next chart. There are some growth options from uh, the 81 tons. I didn't just magically go from 72 to 81. Uh, it's a suborbital staging. You, you load up the vehicle more. You, uh, you end up uh, with MECO that is a suborbital, but then you've, uh, you separate your third stage uh, with either a J2 or an SSME. And, uh, and off you go. You get to 81 tons by doing that suborbital staging. If you ran your SSMEs at 109%, and uh, I wouldn't let you do that with crew on it, but with cargo on it, you might want to do it. Um, five segment SRBs we've talked about before, if you had an SSME on your departure stage. There's a few things you could do to maybe get above 90 metric tons. There are some, these things are lines on a chart, but there would be great expense and, uh, and a significant amount of uh, development testing required before you would uh, sign up to do any of these. So I wouldn't say, hey, this idea will get you above 90 metric tons. It's, uh, those are thoughts. Next chart. I asked my guys to go off and say, hey, let's just do a PRA. We know what all the uh, different pieces are, all the different components are, except I don't know the EDS or I don't know what, what's under the fairing, but for the uh, stuff that you see in the little picture on the lower right, where would you get? Um, and we did a 5%, 95% study, and you can see the, uh, the numbers for the loss of vehicle that, uh, that we got. Again, this is your third big grain assault here. Next chart. Um, boy, this just makes sense, right, is that uh, if, you're, if your launch abort system is 100% successful, you're, you're flying a pretty safe rocket. Um, it will not be. And uh, it actually may be low uh, if we look at the shock interactions between the, uh, the LAS and the external tank. Um, this is an area that needs a significant amount of study. And, uh, and I think uh, if we were at all serious about doing something like this, we would, uh, we would go work on that as, a, as the first thing we would go do. Next chart. SEP design, uh, I told them I didn't want any RCS, I didn't want any uh, active propulsion system, so post Mico, of course, your fairing is gone, and, uh, and it's, uh, they designed, uh, some of the guys at JSC, a spring mechanism that just pops it out, and you would add the ET tumble valve back on to give you a, a good, clean separation. We think this is a very uh, solvable problem. Next chart. Yeah, we did a little bit of thing there. Next chart. The first bullet is the, uh, is the most important bullet. Um, the HLV design, it is less capable than the current baseline, and, uh, and we need to stress that fact. Um, and it has not been studied to the amount where I feel very comfortable coming up here and telling, uh, telling you a whole lot about it. I think it is something that if we decided we were not going to get the money to do the uh, baseline plan, and uh, we wanted a backup that would provide uh, a lunar capability or a human uh, servicing of the station capability, um, that this is something that we would want to go study again. And again, it's, we've spent 30 years studying it, so we have a, a lot of uh, background to do that. Benefits are obvious. Um, we basically have the parts to build everything. Uh, what we don't have is some structural parts for the keel, for the fairing, uh, and for the, uh, for the boat tail to, uh, to mount up the engines. Um, if you're going to have a development or a program, I think the structural piece is probably the one you would pick. It wouldn't be flight software or engines or anything else like that. Um, another thing that's kind of near and dear to my heart is that the HLV retains uh, the contractor and civil servant uh, skill base that we have right now, um, especially in concert with, uh, with spreading out some of the, the shuttle flights that we currently have on the manifest. Um, I'm very concerned about the industrial base. Um, I'll tell you that, that, you know, the congressional budget numbers that have been provided to NASA uh, basically took away the lunar program, and uh, that's where all of my space shuttle civil servants were going to go. Uh, the folks at uh, Marshall were going to go to Ares 5. The folks at, uh, at Johnson Space Center were going to go work on Altair, and of course, if the lunar program is gone, I have got to make a place for civil servants. Uh, and it's just worse on the contractor side if, uh, if the lunar program goes away. Uh, potentially support ISS for crew and cargo. We talked about that a little bit. And I, I really don't want to get into architecture discussions, especially with Dr. Crawley, because he knows a whole lot more about it than I do. But he left, so okay. 
Um, let's talk <laughs> architecture for a minute. Uh, well, it's, you know, because this is that's what, not what I'm here to talk about. I, I'm talking about a, a uh, capability to provide uh, uh, heavy lift capability into, into low Earth orbit and then, then off you go. Uh, I did have a, because this is a little bit different than shuttle, see I had a, a short movie, a couple minutes. Uh, if, Go ahead. Okay. And it, it, I think it just helps you. The music is really corny. I did not pick up the music on this. <laughs> so maybe if the sound is turned off, I'll, I'll tip somebody really good. Um, <laughs> very nice. And it just shows, it just shows the buildup of the vehicle. And this is very simplistic, right? But it shows you fairing. And there's a whole bunch of different things. My, uh, my graphics guys got really excited on me here. Um, what I really want you to see is the, is the launch and the fairing separation. So. Oh, here it comes, great. No tip for you. Yeah. Yeah. And as people are watching, um, we could ask questions that are really loud and drown out the sound if you, uh, if you would like. <coughs> I don't know about you guys, but I'm blown away by what they can do with graphics nowadays. And this was just a, a conceptual uh, lunar lander on an EDS to be, uh, to be designed. I didn't pick the music in this song, it was not me. This was stolen from the uh, Constellation program. Probably all we can stand up and so much. I'll give you half a minute if you here. Okay, so that gives you a little better idea. And, and again, I wanna I wanna really stress the fact that this has not been um, been uh, uh, vetted or or um, discussed in the level of detail it needs to be uh, throughout the entire NASA and contract communities. It's an old idea, and there's a few changes to an old idea, and uh, and. Uh, that's all I was going to present today. Terrific. That was very well done. I've got, please go ahead, Leroy. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, let's see, I just wanted to ask you about your first conclusion. HLV design is less capable than the current baseline. You, mem you mean that it's less capable than the current baseline because the current baseline includes Ares 5, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And, so uh, and the current baseline is an architecture that has a very large, very capable lander. Right. And there's no way sure. to, to do that on, on this vehicle, both from the volume side or the, or the propulsion side. Right. But if we're just thinking of, of Ares 1, comparing this to Ares 1, let me, let me make sure, I, understanding that your numbers are extremely preliminary and haven't been vetted by uh, the community, four and a half years, 6.6 .6 billion, 72 metric tons of cargo and uh, Orion with crew to, uh, to orbit. With your caveats, I would I would With the caveats, yes. right. Okay, so in, the, in that context, uh, maybe you or maybe Doug can uh, kind of give us a high-level answer. I mean, I'm sure ESAS looked at this kind of architecture as well as the direct type architecture. Can you uh, kind of give us a high-level big picture of why uh, the current architecture was selected over, uh, why these architectures were rejected? It's, it's a requirement. Well, no, it's uh, and I'll have, it's a requirements discussion. It's it's what kind of lander do you want to put on the moon? What kind of capability driven, do you want driven to driven by the lander? The and right. okay. and they were they were given a mission sure. and they built an architecture that would support that mission. This vehicle will not support that mission. It'll support a different mission, but we'd have to go and change that architecture. Okay. Is that fair, Doug? Is that it's a requirements discussion? So it was, it was pretty much driven by the lunar mission and the lander requirements. Why don't you come up so we can, so everybody can hear you? Um, I, I don't think they actually studied, or they they, they, they didn't look at directly the uh, crude version of it because of, uh, they considered it a safety issue. I think probably because it was next to the tank, but they looked at the uh, the cargo capability, and and they were looking at the mission. Overall, I think. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and if, um, if, you, if you automatically said it was uncrewed, that gives you three launches, right? Because you're going to put the crew on Ares, and then you had your uh, you had an EDS with the lander, and another EDS for the 
for the crude thing that went up. And three launches is. I my think my question uh, relates to that same sort of line of, uh, of thinking. Many years ago, I was involved in a study where we had actually recommended building a, a shuttle C or something very similar to it. Uh, and uh, at that time, it seemed to make sense because you could pair it with the, uh, the shuttle. Right. And so you didn't have to risk uh, astronauts to provide trucking. Right. And uh, you could use astronauts to fix Hubbles and the likes. It seemed to make more sense to us. And uh, today, if you were to say you aren't going to have a shuttle for whatever reason, if you weren't, uh, then you've almost got to go to the Orion version or something like that. Uh, but your, your uh, reliability figures, uh, loss of crew figures, uh, if my memory is correct, uh, showed the, uh, the Orion version of what you might call a shuttle seat arrived or something was much less uh, uh, reliable, less safe uh, than the uh, Constellation uh, configuration. And that sort of surprises me. Can you elaborate a bit? Uh, no. The, uh, why? Because I don't have any knowledge of, of uh, the Constellation numbers. I can tell you shuttle program numbers are not as good as what Jeff presented earlier. Um, our mean is uh, 1 in 81 are 5% and 95% are 1 in 57 and 1 in 117. Those are numbers that are very uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, I, I think that, uh, that the effectiveness of the launch abort system is going to completely drive what the final number is going to be, and I have no idea um, how effective that is going to be because that we haven't be studied it. should be relatively independent of which vehicle it was on, though, if that's the driver. Perhaps. Nope. Well, we shouldn't design vehicles. I, day, oh, I'd like to. I mean, I've, I had a ball today because, it, you know, if you like yeah. space, this is kind of neat stuff. But The other thing that occurred to me, uh, I'm, I've not been that close uh, in recent time, but uh, the concern over Sophie peeling off, uh, that was a problem for the shuttle, clearly, because the leading edge of the shuttle was right. exposed. With this configuration, is that would that be viewed as a problem or... Uh, Okay, the, the shuttle program manager piece of me says we fixed that problem. We're very vigilant about it, but we, we understand it and have fixed that problem. But it doesn't matter if we did or not because, of course, you have, you have a, um, a very robust bearing with no TPS issues. Yeah, you have a different geometry here, too. Right. Okay, other questions from the committee? Just, just to follow this up so I'm, I'm sure I understand it, it seems like the conclusion is that the, the um, biggest problem identified with... Um, this, uh, this external system was the, the loss of crew probability. But you showed a graphic, and I understand all the caveats you applied to everything that you showed us, good. This, this plot of probability of loss of crew with the launch abort system. And it looks like, you know, at least at one end of that plot, you want that one gets into the range for loss of crew accidents that, that the current architecture is in. Is, is that correct? I, again, it is completely dependent on the uh, launch abort system uh, capability. So it's just not quantified well enough. You know, and, and I kind of laugh, right, because after Challenger, we made a big run at trying to put an, an abort capability, a crew capsule capability at the tip of the orbiter, but you just can't do it from a weight standpoint and a design complexity standpoint. This is basically that same thing. So we have some studies that, that have some of the dynamics associated with that, but we need to go back and really go through that and really understand that because the safety of this vehicle depends exactly on that one thing. Okay, we thank you very much. Real quick, real quick, oh, I'm wait, sorry, wait, wait. one more, Bo. But basically, uh, Doug, uh, LAS improves a launch vehicle loss of crew by a factor of 10, roughly. I mean, do, you know, John had this curve, but, uh, and I think you guys are talking effectiveness of like 90% effective, so that would uh, increase it by a factor of 10, I guess, right? Well, it's do you 90 agree with that? on top of a rocket, though, and this is a different. Y yes, yeah. Different design. The failure modes of the rocket and the trajectories, um, the actual uh, ascent profile um, differ between different different designs. Um, where you are when when there is a, is a failure, uh, if if there's a range to struck on a tank, uh, do you want to be sitting next to it? Kind of, you know, that can, that sort of discussion can get into this. If you're sitting up on top and do a range to struck. Uh, because you're off course, um, 
that tends to look better. I mean, we back back when uh, uh, I was in the shuttle program office uh, after Challenger, and we were getting ready to fly a Galileo, which had an uh, RTG on it, and we studied the Titan 34D uh, launch destruct. We we uh, looked at uh, uh, we looked at the how the how the boosters destructed on Challenger because they were they did a range destruct after the accident because they kept flying, and we they recovered hardware out of the ocean uh, out of the ocean, and looked at how the how the boosters came apart, and they tended to fly sideways more than they did up. So um, it it matters where you are in terms of what what failure and what mode of destruct you're in. So that, I mean that's a that's a long discussion, okay. but, but that, those kind of things do come. But it, by the same token, you, not, but again, I don't want to design rockets here. Well, maybe I do, but we shouldn't. <laughs> I do. Uh, <laughs> if you if you slide the cargo, the side mount forward, you could still have the uh, the escape capsule. Uh, very, you say not. It, it, we need to. We, I, I'll design, but the the CG becomes a real issue then. And that, you end up saturating serious? your gimbal capability, so, so you don't. Okay. I, the range, of course, we don't have a range package on the ET. Uh, we have them on the solid rocket boosters, and if we were going uh, off course, you've got plenty of warning to before the range takes action. So okay, we probably should. It does. Move ahead. Well, that is true about every single page I just showed. Is it has to be studied if we want to go look at it. So.